I'm Mike Russell, and welcome to a session on powerful development methods. Now, before you start for the exits, this is a session on business agility. It's just that the same development methods that you may have known here elsewise in the conference, the same lean and agile methods that have proven so powerful for developing systems and products, my premise I want to give you this morning, one of them, is that those same methods can prove inordinately powerful in working on the system that is the organization. In other words, we use those same methods and thinking to work on the system that produces the systems and products that you're producing. Okay? And it may not have your coffee yet this morning, so to keep from being fogged up, you may look at it again. We're going to work on the system that produces the systems. Or if you're from the product side, work on the product that produces the products. Now let me introduce another key concept to you. That is that you can probably make more of a difference than you think you can make to the organization or to your business or to whatever unit that you're a part of. Why? It's because by working on the system that produces the systems or working on the product that produces the products, if you want to think of it that way, your impact can be more powerful, can be leveraged, can be magnified because the impact will not be just on the very specific product or project that you're working on now, but will be on every single one that's produced in the future. So every 5% improvement, you might say, to the organization makes a 5% improvement across all the products or projects, not just the one that you're working on now. So let's take that idea even one step further. There's an old comic strip named Pogo, for the main character, who's also the main Pogo. And this statement's been used many, many times, millions of times probably. We have seen the enemy, and he is us. Now what that's implying is that sometimes we're our own worst enemies. In other words, how we organize our work, how we go about our work, makes things worse rather than better. So my contention to you this morning is a different one. We have seen the hero, and he is us. Why? Because as agilists, or new aficionados, people who know something about me and Agile, by working on that system to improve the system, you can be the hero. Now, why do I use the term hero? Well, it's because it's a matter of life and death. In this case, life and death of the organization, the team, the company, the business that you're in. Okay? Life and death matter and because of how you're involved and the enormous impact you can have, you can make a difference. You can be a hero to all those people that you're around. All right. So the good news is, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about this morning, you already know something about. So it's not a major learning exercise, except for the fact that we're going to take those pieces and put them together maybe in a little bit different way, a little bit different model to think about, to be able to use them to then impact the organization. Now, the bad news is, is I just used the word model. We are going to be talking about models, theories, some of that stuff. We have to back up, go to the higher level first, before we can then use them effectively. Otherwise, as with all things being systems, is that if you make a change and you don't really know why you're making the change or the system that affects, you may end up making things worse. All right, so let's jump into it. Let me just give you an explanation about the start of my quest around the beginning of this. All right. I started as a developer, as an analyst, same as many of you have, and I'm doing estimating on projects, right? And being a good estimator, I'm trying to think in terms of all the curves that you're emphasized or that you're encouraged to use when you're doing estimates. This one is a curve about probabilities, about where the outcome, the idea of doing a 50-50 estimate, right? The idea of, you know, instead of coming one that's most likely to come or least likely to come up one that's 50-50, right? I also thought in terms about the, um, the funnel, right, the uh, development funnel, uh, the con the, I'm sorry, the, uh, right, the cone of uncertainty, meaning that at the beginning of a project, things are more uncertain than at the end, obviously, because you, as you know more and learn more, you can make better estimates. So I'd work through all that stuff, I'd come up with the best estimates I could, and I'd march in there with all my papers and back up, and I'd give them a range, along with the associated probabilities of why I thought that was going to happen. In other words, what's the risk of this happening? Was it big? Was it small? How big was that cone of uncertainty? And what do you think the answer I got back was, or the response back? 
What do you normally get when you go in with a range or something like that? Yeah, just give us a number. I'm like, what? <laughs> all this work I've went through, I'm trying to tell you, you know, from a business standpoint, there's all this risk and all these other things. They said, no, just give us a number. And so I thought about it. And then as I go through these estimates, like, if I have to give them a single number, which one am I going to give them? Which one would you be likely to give them? The higher one, probably, right? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to get crushed at the end. So what response should I get back to them? That book, you've got to be kidding me. You must be padding, right? You must be putting all this stuff in. So well, look, I just gave you all these estimates around to put through all this spiel again. And I was really frustrated. And over time, as I started to work and became a team lead and later an executive consultant, all this thing, I kept working on this concept about what's the issue here? You know? Is it an individual lack of understanding? In other words, is the problem with them? You know, is it a problem with me and how I'm doing this? Or what is the exact issue behind this? What's causing this? What's the root cause behind all of this? Or is it the fact that the system, the organization, has been designed such that the normal response for those people on the business side, those other people, was to reject what I was saying. So more over time, that's the answer that it came to. It's not the fact that they're not smart. They are smart. I mean, most of the people you work with are really smart. It's just that their aims, their perceptions, cause them to say, just give me a single number, right? The system I'm working in requires that I have a single number for input. The financial system requires a single number. If I put it in a range, it'll blow up, right? So that's not what I need to do. So the system components that we're going to talk about in brief today really are four parts. This is one of two models that I'm going to give you that I've come to at the top level. And these slides will be available after the conference, right? So you don't have to worry about scribbling really hard. Just think about get the get the concept down. Four key components here. I'm not going to give you a systems model in terms of feedback loops and all that, because by the time we get through that, it'll be the end of the session, right? So I'm going to give you the components here, the leverage points. One being culture, second being people, third being the overall strategy organization, and the fourth being processes and systems. Don't have to worry about in detail what that is. Just keep in mind that there are these four spheres. Every time you make a change to that system, there is the organization. You're usually going to touch on one of these. Now, the key leverage areas that you have, from my perspective, and this is what we're actually going to talk more in detail about from an overview this morning session, is one, the leadership of the organization, always the critical component. But secondly, design thinking. I'll give you a little bit of an overview about design thinking and what that means to the organization. And then thirdly, the Lean Agile Renaissance, which is where you come in. All right, so let's go back to what we were talking about before, the key issue of life and death here. Right? And what we're trying to get to is for you to help your organizations to survive and thrive in the chaos and uncertainty that's today's business world. Right. And so my proposal to you is that you are that life ring or that hero that's going to help. So what causes organizational death? Top level categories, one, a bad idea, OK? <laughs> but anybody know what this is? Recognize it? What? Well, it's not a palm. It's an apple palm, if you will. This is the written, right? Not exactly one of the great product successes of all time, but it came from a company that's known for product successes. But what did they do? They took the things they learned from it, and from that came the iPod, and then out of that, again, came the organizational system that's really iTunes, which is where the money's really made, right? That whole ecosystem. <clears throat> so a bad idea doesn't necessarily kill you. What about bad outside events? The economy, it's one of those going on right now. So let's look at things that happened during past economic periods. For instance, during the Great Depression in the United States and elsewhere around the world, two companies that are now worldwide powerhouses, household names, Walt Disney, McDonald's, started during the Great Depression. Right? During the early 80s Depression, Microsoft started, Harley Davidson made a huge turnaround, uh, Electronic Arts, Adobe, not minor names, but they started when times were bad. So it's not outside of it. So how about during the 90s recession? IBM made a big turnaround. They were dying, made a turnaround at the worst of times. Bungie started, I'm sure none of you play any of their games, 
uh, tech bubble crashed when the iPod was actually launched from Apple. And now, in the current recession, Groupon, more than billions valuation has been lost. So, I mean, gained, or right. Um, so it's not really outside events, right? You can overcome that. So maybe it's the execution of the issue. That's so what then, from an execution standpoint, might be some of the realizational problems? Well, you may have seen this. It's called a sigmoid curve. The idea is that organizations all have life cycles. They start, right? They start building up, they come to maturity, and then eventually decline and death. So that's the curve, right? You start going up, and then you decline and die. The crisis point B is when you either notice at some point in time that things are going down, or you know that they're going down, and you've got to make a decision about what to do. So the idea here that you are using all the economics courses, all the courses about business, is hey. Let's change things so that we start our investing in the future when we're at the riding the crest at the top. So we start again and then take it to another higher plane, another higher plateau. So we start layering these sigmoid curves so that we not only survive now, but we continue to survive in the future. But it requires investing now for the future, that sort of idea. What typically happens? Right? The common reality is, is that we hit that crisis point and it's almost too late, or it is too late, to invest and we just go down the tubes, right? One trick goes down from a business perspective. All right, so let's take this in a little more detail. If we take that curve, it's the same as a single product life cycle. From a product perspective, we do development, and if you look at the profits curve here, we make an investment, so the profit is going down because we're expending, right? We're putting stuff into the product. We introduce it, we now we start making sales. Well, hopefully we start making sales if it's a good idea. So sales and profits start rising. They come up, right? Grow, hit maturity. The apex, the peak of getting income, revenue, everything else, and then they decline. So that's the sigmoid curve in regards to a business, but it's also from a product perspective. So now, if we, how to extend organizational life, the idea here is that we want to extend that peak as long as possible. We want to improve our operational methods so that we're going to get as much out of that product, that cycle, as possible, right? To extend that maturity, making it as long as possible, right? So that product is there. And then, just like you have the double curves, is that we're going to take another product and start developing it. When we've got the revenue to do it, when we've got the margin to do it, so that we can invest for the future. Right, that's the theory. Again, more typical is, is that we wait until too late, Right? We don't start thinking about the next product once we introduce one or start getting the revenue, and we start panicking down the line, and it just goes downhill from there. And there's some other issues here. For instance, this is an old view from PMI of products versus, I mean, projects versus uh, operations. Look at what I've highlighted here. Catalyst for change, which is projects. The whole point of doing a project is to do something different, right? I mean, if, you do, if you're going to do the same thing, then we don't even bother starting with a project. We just do what we're doing. Right? But from an operational perspective, is maintain a status quo. Right away, if you're doing anything from a project perspective, we're now coming at loggerheads. Because I've got one team that's saying, hey, let's make some changes. Let's get some things going. Let's make an impact on the organization. And another team is going, whoa, hold your horses there. We want everything to stay the same. We want to maximize our efficiency, get things moved out, right? So another conflict, projects and operations, okay? So from a perspective also of extending the life of the company is that if I'm focusing on getting that maturity and making it longer, I'm getting a certain set of capabilities that helps me to optimize. In fact, optimization is one of the key focus points during maturity, I mean, during that peak time, right? Systemizing, taking everything, putting it into a system, right? And then the you know, land of Six Sigma, getting the last ounce of profit revenue that we can out of the system. But if most of the organization is focused on extending the life of that revenue, right? All that life of the organization, those approaches don't work over in the product development side. They don't work in innovation. Some of them do, but most of them are focused totally different, right? Again, the change versus status quo. And there is what is called the rearview mirror trap. Um, this is a quote. So there are, we've got all these forms of analytical um, 
logic to draw on the past rather than the future. So in other words, it's the, called the rear view mirror trap because the only thing you can conceive about the future, if you're using purely analytical methods, is that which you've already done. So you got that, right? If you just use analysis and, uh, and analytical methods of what's happened in the past, then you're only looking for variations on the past. You're not looking for a big break, a big innovation for the future. All right, so that brings the resulting paradox is that if I have these curves where I'm trying to extend my new revenue, my revenue of the existing organization, but I'm also trying to introduce new things that keep me from hitting that crisis point, from being able to survive in the future, then that success that I've got at the top of the curve that I'm really trying to bring for later usually means I'm going to be less successful when I'm introducing something new that's going to help me succeed in the future. So on one hand, I am, the more successful I am, and getting that revenue and maintaining the status quo means from an organizational perspective, not from an individual perspective necessarily, but from an organizational perspective, I'm going to be less successful in introducing the very things I need to do to be successful in the future. So that's the key paradox about how the organization is set up. That's why the questions, right, from the development slide, like when I'm doing my estimates and I'm going all these points and ranges and, you know, risks and everything, is it just give me a number? Because it's different things, different talking. So some reasons about why the top is emphasized. In other words, keeping things status quo, systemizing and optimizing. Here's a picture from the original uh, Ford assembly line. The concept of the whole assembly line concept is let's keep things exactly the same, have highly specialized jobs so we do the best that we can at one thing at each point on the line. Also, the famous experiments, if you had any management theory about uh, plants at GE's Hawthorne plant, right? The Hawthorne scientific management of time material study, right? About how people are doing their work, how can we improve their work, is all around analysis of what's existing. From their own perspective, in financial markets, you know, US, for instance, the bosses here in India, it's a short term range of what results can we get now, which is the emphasis on what? the revenues and profits that we currently have, not necessarily the future, right? And that pressure is on the CEOs and the rest of the organization to produce for right now. All right. So here's the central paradox, again, in a slightly different picture. We've got these opposing views, approaches, and goals, but we need both of them, not just one of them. This is not an either or. It's not the same thing as me arguing with them and saying, but you really should take this range. And they're saying, no, I need this point estimate. It's we really need to figure out how to work with both of them. Because on the development side, I want to increase variation. Operation side, I want to decrease variation. Right? It's the whole point of Six Sigma other things. Get rid of the variation, because that costs you money and makes the efficiency lower. I want to do change. Don't do change. I want people on this side right, that are highly skilled and probably aren't going to maybe be able to do 10 different things. Right? On that side, I'm looking for people that are slot in. The whole idea of the assembly line, right? It's a narrow set of skills. If they don't work out, I find somebody with the same set of skills. I'm likely to do that where you need intuition and special product development. On that side, optimization and also reliability and stability, two key words. All right. So it's also a different thinking approach. Analysis, intuition, and what can be. Right. Again, from a using them, I'm giving you all these terms here because these are words that you've used in different contexts, but I'm putting them here specifically to pull out the things that you learn from a lean and agile perspective and put them in the higher model. So from the product side, we're thinking about what could be, it's that intuition part. And from what will be from a rational or deterministic side, and what we're really looking for is should be, right? Design the organization using both of them so we should have the profits, we should have the future, right? Both sides of a coin, not an either or, a both and, right? So what are some of the solutions to this? Well, one is design thinking. I mean, here I've heard of design thinking, right? Read about it, anything about it? Okay, a few. The whole idea behind design thinking is essentially what I just gave you, but not necessarily in those terms. It's all about kind of what happens in the organization, and I'll give you some of that right now as an overview. Uh, here's Tim Brown from IEO. His view of it is, what can we know, what's viable from a business perspective, what's desirable from a human perspective, and what's feasible or possible from a technological perspective, we need to take all three sides of that and put it together to figure out what we're going to do with the organization. From an existing thinking standpoint, um, I have different thinking 
are is if I make deductive and inductive approaches, depending on which one you pick, it's either from the general to the specific or from the specific to the general. But that's using existing knowledge and existing points about what's happening. Right? What we need is something about what could be in the future. Right? And taking data points that are maybe outside of those current things, things that are happening now that don't fit my models about the past because they're about the present. Right? And so my goal then is to identify not what is true from the past from analysis from the product development side. I need to be thinking about what could be possibly true, take those data points, come up with a new model, right, and use what in design thinking terms, if you read any of the literature, is called abductive thinking. But less important than the abductive title, look at these words that they use to describe it. Empiricism, in other words, an empirical approach, hypothesis, experiment, refine. Have you heard of that before? Well, of course you have. That's the whole Android approach, right? It's come up with a model, institute it, right? Find out how it operates, inspect and adapt, continue to do the future. But they don't use that term in design thinking literature, that kind of approach. They use these, talk about the different thinking and how it comes up. Now, this is Martin's view uh, from his book on design thinking, a lot of his work, is that there's this knowledge funnel. I put product funnel up there in parentheses because you're used to product development funnels, it's essentially the same thing, but applying to the business standpoint, I have all this data out here, right? Unformed data. I can't make heads or tails of it, it's just letters, other things, give you an idea that it's unanalyzed data. It goes into the funnel. There are four stages from Martin's viewpoint. There's mystery, right? I have no idea what this means. Right? If you ask me to read all this stuff, I couldn't have any idea what it means. But the more I work with those data points, and I get some intuition about what's happening. Now I can think about what's going on, right? I can then start thinking about making a heuristic or some rules of thumb about how to deal with it. And the final stage is systemization or an algorithm. Right? We're familiar with algorithms from a software standpoint because that's basically what software is. But he's, the design thinking community is saying, in broader terms for the business, is let's follow that same kind of product funnel that people do when they're designing products for realization, right? Think about the business model that's being used to produce the profits, right? How do we make sense of what's happening out in the environment and then work to those stages the same way? Start with that complex, keep going until we have it simple enough and reduced enough that we can implement an algorithm effectively in organization. In other words, implement a system like software that the organization is going to run on. Right, so in picture terms, just think, there's a whole bunch of data out here. Then it comes the human element, intuition. What can I think about this? Then heuristic, music we know a lot about, but there's no thing that we can program to produce beautiful music all the time. It still takes a human element, right? There's still human factors involved. And then the key there from those first three steps to the last stage is get it to the point where we don't need human involvement. We can reduce it to such a set of rules, so a flow, and we can also implement that from a systems perspective that we don't need human involvement or very little, right? Because the human side is actually the expensive side. The whole point of trying to get out of these first three stages to the last stage, not just from a product perspective, but the overall business perspective, is to get it to that algorithm stage. Why? Well, if I take all that, right, the efficiency gains come when I can systemize something. I can remove my expensive human components. Not that we're not needed, but if I have to use completely human-based system, it's going to be a lot more expensive than if I can reduce it to software or a machine or something to get equivalent results. So my aim is to get it to the algorithm stage from a business perspective, have the business specified suitably in the operations end, I'm not talking about the product development end, but the top of that curve, right? To maximize that curve, we need to get to the algorithmic stage from the business standpoint so we can maximize that efficiency. Because the only way then that we can invest for the future is to get that efficiency, to get that margin, to be able to pay for the exploration and to come up with new models for the future. All right, so everybody tracking with me so far? I know it's early in the morning, just a lot of theory here. <laughs> All right, so let's take an example. Healthcare IT. When I was speaking at GE at their second annual uh, Agile Transformation Conference last year, 
the head of healthcare IT actually gave some things, right? Because we've got a bunch of objectives for the year. I looked at the objectives and it mapped perfectly. On one hand, he's saying, let's get the business to a point where we can optimize and systemize that we can reduce unit costs by at least 10%. You know, unit cost out in GE terms. So let's reduce, increase our profits on the curve of what we've got existing from a product perspective. Also, one of the objectives he gave him though is that every segment must have an annual breakthrough. Not just improvement, not just incremental improvement, but a breakthrough. So what he said in design thinking in funnel terms was, we need both of these. We don't just need one. We need both the efficiency side and we need the front end implementation side. Right? So I'm going to ask you another question in your terms. What are your typical tasks is when you get a project? Do you say, or does someone say to you, here's the project? I want to know all these things about the project and how, you know, I want to know them up front and I want you then to achieve them with any variation, without any variation. Is that what you get? Or do you get possibly somebody that says, just give me a ballpark estimate, you know, let me know how we're progressing and how you think things are going and what changes you need. Or maybe do you get, I think this is the right thing to do, just get started and let's see if it's the right direction and we start getting the results, right? So just a show of hands. When you get a tasking, how many of you get this task in here? This is kind of a, a general idea, just go get it. All right, I got one. Well, a few. All right, what about the middle one? Now, I'm talking on average right now. So more. What about the last one? Interesting, all right? We got a spread. Typically when I talk to audiences about this, it's more on the right side, right? It's the give me the, the system model, right? Plug all this stuff in, all these requirements, and spit out on the other side exactly what your schedule and your cost and all the other information is that you then have for the project, right? Or in our terms, the waterfall model. Or it's the, uh... So the common problem that comes from that, if you hear that, is someone who's thinking about that optimization side, right? And they're trying to take that same side thinking over there where I'm trying to systemize, optimize, get one answer in, and it always gives me the same answer out the other side to the left side of the equation where I'm trying to develop things where I don't know exactly what the answer is maybe. I just know I've got to put some inputs and then try to adjust as I go. Right? So that's a key fundamental problem that comes up, and in terms of design thinking, that's why. Because you'll hear them talk about this funnel and you need all parts of it, but most parts of the organization are set up for the right side. Right, so applying it to software, right? It's the best that we can do, and think about this, usually when we develop software, we have end goals in mind, but we can't guarantee, in other words, I don't have this black box that I can put the requirements in and spit out the exact set of software that's going to do it on the other side. There's still that human element, There's, that's why we're here, right? <laughs> to make that difference in what's happening, right? So, what I'm trying to do with all my methods is to increase my probability of success and more risk. It's not only to get the right answer, because I can't guarantee the right answer, I can get close to the right answer, but it's to have more success in doing so. As opposed to the holy grail of what some have tried to do over the years of software has come up with that algorithm or process to produce the software that guarantees success because of the requirements on one side. Right? We can't operate if, if the right side exists. We have to operate as a center. Or if you hear things, give us a software factory, right? I put the raw materials on one side, out comes the finished software on the other side. It's not a factory. It's not that assembly line perspective, right? As opposed to the vague research stuff, which is exactly the pushback I got in my early days when I gave them the ballparks and the, the risks and everything else. All right. If I put those two together, if I put the design thinking funnel along with here, it fits well because I've got my development in part, which is up here. Then I have the operations part where I'm trying to get the margin out, right? So what the design thinkers are saying is perfectly in alignment with what you know from the agile perspective and from the organizational curve, right? So we want to have that optimization after the development so we can continue to invest in the future, right? And both of them require the different thinking and approaches that we talked about. Back to our earlier slide, the differences between the two areas, right? One is should be. And the real question is, how do we maintain these opposing views with excellence on both sides, not just one side? 
Well, if I look at the design thinking literature, Martin, for instance, here are the points he says that you should do from action points. And you're reading the book, I went through it, and others in the literature, and they say, okay, you need to know your view of the world and your role in it, which is a good thing. You need to know the tools that you can use to understand those views and how to organize it. And you need experiences, build your awareness and ability to discern over time what's happening and then to improve. I looked at that and I thought, this isn't helping me a lot. <laughs> this is kind of, it, it, yeah, I got it, but what do I do now? Right? So what practically we do now, and here's the key marriage point between the concepts, is that lean and agile, because they fit exactly that front, fuzzy front end that they're talking about, that has to be married with that operational efficiency end, right? Everything that you're learning about lean and agile, we can do to improve the organization, right? Use that as the practical way to implement that design thinking that is supposed to balance the two parts because there isn't much on practical implementation, but we've got the keys to the kingdom, so to speak. In other words, what I'm saying is, is enter the agile dragons, right? You guys, right? You're the ones who are going there and slice and dice and show them how this stuff fits together because you're one of the few people in the world, literally, who understands how you can balance those things, right? So back to my point earlier, right? is that you are the heroes of the organization and they need you because it's not just a matter of the product or system that you're working on currently, the technical one, but it's the long-term success and health of the organization. So let's talk about the Lean Agile Renaissance. I say Renaissance is because this is actually the way things used to work, and then we got so heavily systemized in the 20th century with assembly lines and everything else that we were doing that we kind of lost our way. This is if our audiences need to know about Agile. I'm going to bypass these, right? So. Good execution, agile execution of ideas, not the execution of the operations part, because we know that. Most organizations have that down cold. They can figure out how to do that, run Six Sigma, all those other sort of things, not Lean, lean Six Sigma or Six Sigma product, but the original Six Sigma, right? And if I execute well in an agile way, if I take those three reasons earlier that I talked about why organizations fail, I can not only improve my execution, but because I'm going to iterate, I'm going to take an idea and make it into a good idea that will succeed in the marketplace if it even has a chance of succeeding. Right? Just like Apple, I take the idea of a mutant and I come forward and I build them into a better one. Also, I'm going to be able to use that power of inspect and adapt to overcome outside events. Right? Because I'm going to find what's going to work. I'm not just going to go with something and either succeed or fail. Right? So, the life comes from that. Right? So, from an execution standpoint, if I then apply the Agile principles to the stuff that is we keep building here, the idea of the funnels, right, the design thinking, if I, if I look at this stuff up front with a human element, that's exactly where Agile fits. Because if you look at what we talked about earlier, as far as design thinking, and then see all the words that are used here, iterative, empirical, concept of customer value, collaboration, just enough to succeed, concentration on flow and work and process, you know, transparency, inspect and adapt, and all those sorts of things, some of them actually fit to the right, but they especially fit over here. And so I can leave, from an operations standpoint, my deterministic view of life, add the empirical, and then try to work and figure out what the interface is between them. So in software development terms, agile, waterfall, and lean is actually an overview, from my perspective, is kind of an umbrella that fits across both of them. Right? So, you hear a lot of arguments these days in the agile community about dev versus ops, right? It's the ops guys want stability, the development guys want this agility thing, they want to cycle a thousand times a minute, right? And the ops guys are saying, well, maybe once every a thousand years, right? But that world is coming because think about it from their perspective. Their incentive and their whole role in their life is for stability in operations. So from the point that we've been talking about here today is that their reason for being is that stability and efficiency side of it, right? And so there are things that they want when they talk to you, right, is exactly that side, whereas you're coming at it from the development side, right? Also from the business perspective, there's a big perception gap that applies no matter what model you're using, right? So let's think about it. I make on the right side, and that's what we're trying to stretch out to improve, to make as long as possible, to get as much money as I can out of the existing systems and products. On the left side, I'm trying to spend it. So in terms of 
you know, the lifeblood of the organization, if you will, is that money that's flowing in, that revenue, right? But what happens on the left side? You're spending it, right? So that view of the organization is these guys are like vampires. They're sucking the organizational blood from us, right? All they demand is, yeah, give me more of that blood, right? Oh, I've got to this point. I need some more funding for this project, right? So their view of it is, is that they're trying to make money and keep as much of it as possible, and we have all these organizational vampires that are running around trying to suck it out of us. I mean, think about it. <clears throat> this analogy is better than you think. So what do vampires do? Has anybody seen a three-fanged vampire? I assume everybody's seen vampire movies, right? Horror movies, raise hands. Yes? Okay. You've never seen a three-fanged vampire. They always have two, right, on the course. Like, yeah, okay, it's just kind of a given. It's a given that they've got a coffin somewhere that's got some dirt from Transylvania, where they came from, that they go back to. And they never come out in the daytime. Well, I hate to tell you, but, you know, IT folks kind of the same. Think about it. They go back to their coffins or cubicles, sorry, right? They don't want anybody around it because they've got everything set up just right. They're all in their dirt, right? They don't know what it is. They don't know messing with it. Somebody from the organization comes by and tries to tell them to clean it up. They resist. And a lot of them like to work at night instead of the daytime. So I've got on this one side, these vampires are sucking up. And they come, the organization says, you know what? We've got to contain these vampires. So what they're going to do? What are the tools that you have for controlling vampires in movies, right? It's things like garlic, wooden stakes to kill them. They use the same thing in the organization. Things like stage gate approval processes, organizational garlic, right? Okay, if we get to have them tell us what they're doing at certain points in time, we can keep them from sucking more blood from us because we can shut the thing off before it gets more of it, right? The stake in the heart, right? So think about it in terms from a perception perspective is that this is kind of a funny way of looking at it. <laughs> if you keep, it's sort of a better picture of a vampire, whatever you want here. But if you keep that in mind, when you're coming to them, it's almost like you're speaking a completely different lingo the same way, right? Because they have this view of what they're trying to achieve, and you're coming at it from a completely different perspective, right? To make it worse, this is a survey in the, in the 2000s from Spencer Stewart of the backgrounds of CEOs and top company executives. How many come from engineering? Not a lot. Most of them come from finance. Oh, that's really the realm of multiple numbers. It's the give, it, give me a single number territory, right? Of marketing, law, right? banking, and so on. So most of the top executives are attuned. They know they need something for the future, but unfortunately the way that they're thinking most of the time, because of the pressure from Wall Street or the engine stock exchanges, whatever stock exchange they're dealing with, constant things, they're thinking in terms of those right side terms. So one of the key things you have to do as you're learning all this agile lean stuff is to think about how do I translate from the technical approach, the technical terminology, into that right side terminology. You know, how does it correlate? Don't speak in terms of, you know, we need more blood, we need more funding, but raise it down the road, the broader picture, move up, right? As Mary Pomodick says, measure upward in terms of metrics, right? So, the key here is to connect and comprehend. All the things that you learn about communications from an Agile perspective and all the training that you've had or will have and all the things in the future, it applies the same way, just take it for a different audience, right? Move it up levels, so how can I terminology-wise know what they're thinking, know what the model is, like we've been talking about now, and then change what I'm saying so that it fits the model that they're hearing and they can comprehend it. That's all we're talking about here, right? Knowing a different model and what the issues are, and then take the responsibility for effective communication. Now, I know you, in communication terms, both sides are supposed to take responsibility for it, but in this case, as the organizational vampire, you've got to take all the responsibility to make sure your message gets across. All right? So, from an outside perspective, or outside events, let's talk a little more about that. Um, there's a term that Joseph Schumpeter. Um, came up with called the Girls of Creative Destruction. So, Tom Peters had a view that I love this, and so I quote it here. It says, the only industries that are calm or untouched or not rocked by change are those that are either about to be changed or have been bypassed and they just don't know it yet, right? So, all those things are going outside. If it seems calm now, it means that there's either chaos likely coming or it bypassed you. So, you've got to know what's going on. Expectations are no change or unrealistic. 
So here's one of the keys of how you could connect to the strategic side of the company is that we're trying to make all these changes, okay? And talk about it in terms of the film, 1970, I believe, almost half a million people died. What storms do is they rearrange the landscape. If I take a hurricane, right, it changes all those things and all those depths and what the landscape looks like changes, right? So as those economic storms come through, it means that I need to map frequently, right? Because I have, things are changing, so I have to have a way of coming up with those maps fast, not years, but quickly. Forecast the possibilities and take appropriate risk. Because if I wait for things to calm down, what's going to happen? I will either have been bypassed by the storm and probably beat somewhere, or I've been sunk, right? Because I haven't taken the appropriate action, right? And keep working on that and iterate. This is a quote I love from the president of Pixar, or at least he was, Randy Nelson. Nelson. The core skill of innovators is error recovery, not failure avoidance, right? So iterate, adapt, inspect. All right. One of the key questions you'll hear, why don't we just scale agile to the enterprise? If this stuff is so good that you're telling me about, Michael, why you know, we should use it, well, why shouldn't we scale it to the enterprise? Well, first answer is, let's go back to our curves. The right side doesn't really need agile, per se, if you've got a heavy operations focus. Right? Because it doesn't work, because they need stability and the efficiency to be able to generate the money. So the first answer is we can't be enterprise agile in the same sense of terms of agile like you're learning currently. Right? If I look at the context of organization, I might have new product development, that's MPD, or major variant development. I may have existing product development or enhancements, EPD. I've got manufacturing, I've got operations. Right? That right side is where I want all that efficiency stuff. The left side is where I want the new product development stuff, the increased variation change. Right? So let's take some examples, mobile apps. I don't have a lot on the right side, because most of the mobile apps, unless it's some kind of software as a service thing, you just sell it, and then they use it you know, using that existing data. So I've got small manufacturing. If once I've got the software done, I press the button, if somebody comes in and buys it, I just replicate it, and I'm done. It's not a big manufacturing operation. I don't have what operating, I'm not operating. It's all on the left side. So a mobile app business, if, that's, if I don't have any back end, I can be enterprise agile. Because that's all I'm focusing on, is that kind of development side, if you will. If I take an advertising agency, something outside of software, it's projects-based work. And most of it is new product development, new product being a new advertising campaign, whatever it is that my clients need to come up with, or giving them juice or changes, an existing campaign, multiple outputs on existing ones. Again, not much in manufacturer operations. So they can be agile. What about software as a service? Well, guess what? Now I've got an operations component here. The moment I'm an SAS approach, the moment I step out of development and go to operations, now I have to start thinking about configuring the enterprise for all that operational stuff, stability, efficiency, everything else. So this is the reverse problem. This is where maybe the company or the startup or the product group is all development oriented, but now they need to learn the language and the capabilities of the right side. Right? So if you're a startup or you're thinking about doing a startup, keep that in mind. If I'm an embedded system, now I've got all this stuff. Right? If I'm software, for instance, if you take medical device software, I not only have the software, but I've got the device, I've got all that regulatory world around it, so I have to have everything full bore both sides of the equation. So, the answer to enterprise agile? Well, it depends. And agile being more agility, not just agile. Right? So we can move that way though, because if we take the things with asterisks, customer value, collaboration, just enough, you know, those more on the left side, but that flow work and process can be done. We can start moving in to the appropriate areas on the right. Not everything on the right will be appropriate for all those things. So you have to make the adaptation, think about it, and then inspect and adapt, but taking the pieces off and move it to the right for a fusion. Not either or, but both and. Okay? Very quickly on leadership. I love this quote by Peter Drucker. <laughs> bad management, most of what we call management, or it's bad management, consists of making it difficult for getting people to get their work done. Right? So the whole concept here, what does it mean to be agile leadership? Okay? 
And again, most organizational transformation agendas have to do with that operations side. How can we improve our current cash flow earnings and everything else? It's not necessarily development. Okay, let's go back to that model I showed you earlier, the four pieces parts, right? The leader's design output, if you will, their product is really the organizational system. And if I think of the system in those terms, I have two things that are longer term, more persistent, which is strategy and culture, and I've got two shorter term levers or things that I can do, which is people and processes and systems. Right? We just have to address all aspects. And I'll give you an example here of some of the differences from a product standpoint, I mean from a reliability on the right, front side of the funnel, and innovation on the left. From an organization, I can't have just one organization that fits all. If it's more fluid and more inspect adapt, that means I'm probably going to need a different organizational model. The same org chart concept doesn't fit on the right as on the left. So as a leader, I have to think through that. From the process perspective, that's all what we've been talking about, right? I've got to think through how I'm going to balance that. And not only from a people perspective, not only those things, but also from a people perspective, it means likely that there may be different types of people working on those different things. Right? And the CEO or the leader has to be the balancing force. So when the question comes of how do we balance that, a lot of it rests rest squarely in the lap of leaders of the organization, or team, even down to the team lead perspective. Different kinds of decisions, again, we already talked about that, we'll keep going. The deterministic view, I think you probably know this, is that I can predict outcomes if I have it, if changes are needed, I have failed. Right? So my whole perspective, if I have a deterministic view of life, is that if I have to make a change, I failed. Which is not exactly the whole point, right? That's just that right side. Right? Whereas, also, if I take efficiency as king, as my view as a leader, then I'm going to try to maximize utilization. It's this symbol line approach. Try to get everything, as much out of everything, people and process as I can, removing non-revenue activities. But non-revenue is what? My organizational vampire said, they're the ones who are going to bring the future revenue. It's not a question of revenue. It's a question of revenue now versus revenue for the future. Okay? And this is why, there's a lot of words there, that's the whole reason of why organizations that try and take innovation approaches to life and just try to take some program on the side usually don't get good results because what they're trying to do is apply that stuff that comes to the left side to everything that's built for the right side. And it's just like deflects right off, right? Because it doesn't stick, because it can't stick. So the whole point of if you want to up the innovation in an organization, or from a product development perspective, you have to work on the model of the organization, not just on innovation itself. Right. So from an org chart perspective, again, this is Conway's law, many of you that have, have, have seen this before. So an organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the communications processes or structures within a company. That's just the kind of way it works. This is a statement by Conway that you may not be as familiar with. Because the design that occurs first is almost never the ideal, the prevailing system concept may need to change. Therefore, flexibility of organization is important to effective design. Right now, what does that mean? Obviously, we don't stay the same with organizations. So from a concept of that is, let's go forward one here first. Right? Why do we view reorgs? I mean, if you're an organization, you know, oh gosh, another reorg is coming, right? Why? Why do you respond that way? It's because it has nothing to do with really the effectiveness of the work. It just has to do kind of with power structures and communications and all that other kind of stuff, right? What we really need to be doing is thinking of reorgs as ways of inspecting and adapting right, the organization forward in time and coming with a more positive view of them, as long as they're grounded in involving people in redesigning their own work, because they're the ones who know how to work best, right? And they will support what they create. Right? So the thinking questions for you to take out of here, I don't know if I'm getting a lot of questions, but here are some more, is when you're sitting in other sessions, how do I apply this to the organization? especially just to the structure, one of the most common things that organizations have, the org chart. How do I apply continuous improvement to the design of that org structure? How do I apply continuous improvement to the overall business? Right? Change the shifting, change the shift, not just from continuous improvement for the product, but to the organization. Culture, 
I'll just zip to this. Should these have the same culture? If I take any kind of inland revenue or internal you know, IRS in the US or income tax department here in India, should these two organizations have the same culture? Why? They shouldn't have the same culture because they have different strategies. They have different aims of the organization. So the culture should fit. I know you would prefer that they have the Google structure. Oh, yeah, okay, that looks about right. I'll just take that, right? <laughs> no. They've got rules, right? This is high efficiency. They're is getting the revenue, right? Sort of real stuff, and Google's not about it. But that's because their strategies and their outcomes are different. So you have to tag the culture to what you're trying to do. This also means that inside the organization, you may have to learn how to have separate cultures and to exist at the same time because I've got those different groups. Most organizations try to have a unified culture all the way through down to the detail level. Well, at the top level, yes, that's good because we want organizational identity. So that if someone hears about Google or they hear about companies that work like Google, they're usually referencing the culture, right? Not the product necessarily, but work like Google means a certain set of things. The top level, that's good. But in each individual unit, that may not be good. We may have to have adaptations. Okay? So the manifesto, from a culture perspective, if I take four components of culture, or four uh, types of different culture, meaning a mix of collaboration, how much do we create, how much do we, comp how much do we control, the manifesto, I don't want, this is actually the next section, I'll get into detail here, but the manifesto says is that we want a balance of all these things somewhere in the organization as opposed to an overweight on the control part, right? The hierarchy part, the command and control, the deterministic view that says, I can come up with something at the beginning and control it all the way through, right? It's a dramatic difference between the agile approaches and what life in most organizations is, but it's also a barrier to agile adoption. So when you're thinking about agile adoption, you have to do culture. One last thing to leave you with from a leadership perspective, you need new CEOs. I don't mean the people. Some of you may want to replace the people, but you know, that's not the point here. Notice that there's periods after that. Right? What we need is to think about the stakeholders of the company as being the C, the customers, the E, the employees, the O, the owners, or the business itself, right? What's the, the, the income, the revenue, and significant others. And they have different views on life. It's not like some, if you go to the bookstore or read online, there are some people that say, well, customers should come first. There are others that say employees should come first. There are others that say, well, that's all about the financials. Well, what I'm telling you is to be successful long term, maybe not short term focus, but long term, you have to focus on all of these to be able to survive and thrive. You have to look at what the quality of service and product are for the customers. You've got to look at the work life for the employees. You've got to look at the financial returns. Right? And so that produces this kind of Fortune 500 approach, and this is a USA bias, I'll put it there, is that instead of a balance, it's usually about maximized value. If you look at any of the stock exchanges, that's what the reward is, those short-term gains, all about finances, right? Whereas, yes, we want enhanced value, we want more returns. I just showed you all that model stuff about we need those returns if we're going to be able to do any product development in the future. But it's not just to that or to the exclusion of all the others. We need to put legend, deliver legendary service for our customers. We need a more fulfilling work environment for our employees so that they not only can produce now, but they produce more in the future, right? And they're committed to what they're doing. Because you know, you know from when you work, if you're not committed to what you're doing, you don't do your best work. And if you have any major stakeholders out there, any other partners, that they feel a shared responsibility with us. Okay? So the new rules for the CEOs and you is one. You're the primary responsibility, and this is all the way from a team lead or anybody who's taking a leadership role all the way up to the top. Your goal is to work on the organization, not in it, or maybe it's both, but you have to work on that organization. Your product is the product that produces the product, the system that produces the system. Okay? We define CEOs in the terms I've just given you and be a servant leader, not one that doesn't give direction, but one that guides Right? and make sure that all four parts of those constituencies are served, right? and use lean agile principles to balance both the innovation on one side and the optimization on the other. Okay? 
And then the real kicker is iteratively keep doing this over and over, keep working on the system that produces the systems. Um, you know, from Gandhi's perspective here on it, his famous quote, is that don't wait for others to do it. Start with yourself, right? Start with the area that you can impact and then expand from there. You know, if you can't affect the entire company at the beginning, well, that may not be. But you can at least affect the area that you're in. All right, so be an example. Now, from this stage perspective, since I'm a producer of this stage, I'm also obliged to give you this speech to come, come to the other ends. All variations on this theme, but a little bit more specific to parts of the model. For instance, what about that uncertainty that occurs in business? The session right after this, we'll talk about that. How do we deal with that uncertainty? Customer value is key, both in lean and agile. But how do we quantify that? How do we put the terms of, of value in terms that we can work with from an innovation perspective? Masa will be talking about that. I love this title, Structured Freedom with Rules and Strategies. Now, does that fit the balance of exactly what I'm doing? <laughs> Structured Freedom with Rules and Responsibilities? This kind of follows after that. Risks and Strategies, this is all about risk. How do you deal with that, right, in large scale? Um, perceptions in Malaysia, what do you do with a big bang agile rollout? Matt works for Cerner, we'll talk about that. Continuing adventure and from Yahoo's perspective of their agile transformation. If you don't know agile, I mean Yahoo's history, they started, stopped, and started again. So it's a fascinating story there. And in a case study, uh, particularly in an outsourcing world, is what do you do when you've got to deal with contracts, but at the same time, you have to deal with collaboration and all those other agile values. So lots of good stuff to come from a stage perspective, as well as all the others that are out there. So take what you learn, and my pitch to you is to apply it to the system that produces the systems. So questions-wise, we try to fly through this. I will be here the entire conference. We have the speaker's corner. Nab me afterwards. You know, take a business card, call me later. Fine, that's, I'm here to, to help you. Um, so, be action heroes in the organization. Achieve mastery, one of the prime values of me. Right? Connect and comprehend what, how the business is, how it operates, so you know the model. If you don't know the model, you can't affect it positively. Right? Commit to making a change and exhibit courage in doing so because it's not going to be easy. Nothing of value is necessarily easy, right? So it's going to be rough sometimes, and you've got to get through that. And then implement. Inspect and adapt. Right? Frequently map. Take action. Think about the CEO's model and review and repeat. Okay? So just brief recap. Here's a way to think of the organization. Here are the three levers that you have that you can apply from the Agile map. Agility is that life ring that can help you overcome, from an organizational perspective, the, the near death, certain death that faces it. Right? Think about it in terms of from an inside piece of the organization being a lean and agile powerhouse, right? To coming to a business powerhouse, right? From an area to what the company is. And all this, you know, if you don't like change, you'll like irrelevance even less. Okay? And Change implies some pain, right? Think about the long-term objectives. If the organization can't take it, well, maybe they can't. But you've got to put it back in the terms. This means life and death here. This isn't just kind of some numbers game here, right? Help overcome that pain threshold. And back to our original statement of we have seen the hero. It's us. It's actually you. And I think you can have that inordinate impact on your companies and your organizations. So learn well. Take everything you're doing in this track and the others of the conference and you can be the hero. Thank you.